Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today I'm actually going to be doing a quick follow-up for one of my previous videos, how power and control changes people. Now, when I posted this video, I kind of figured it would be a little bit controversial. And honestly, I was surprised by how many people were not actually like upset at me. I don't know why, but I just figured people would get mad at me for one reason or another. However, there were a series of comments that I saw consistently throughout the video and about one of the experiments that I used that apparently had been disproven that myself and my main researcher, Ali and I both had no idea that it was actually disproven. So we wanted to look into it. Now, the Zimbardo experiment is something that both of us actually studied when we were in college. And at the time it was a pretty famous study and it was used to reference a lot of things about psychology and how people do the things they do based on their situations they're in. Last time I personally remember it being referred to or hearing it, I think was maybe 2016 or 2017. And it was still presented as fact at the time. For her and for me, that was enough to see the study is still valid. However, as some of you guys pointed out in the comment section, recent papers, articles, and archives from the Stanford itself where the experiment was conducted have shown otherwise. The Zimbardo experiment wasn't exactly what we thought it was or what we were taught, and I apologize for treating it as fact or otherwise. I do still believe that power reveals a lot about a person and their intentions, but this study has been deservedly discredited. So I did want to say that like, hey, I made a mistake. I took something from my memory banks of something I remembered from years ago in college, and I still took it as fact, and I didn't do my due diligence on this topic, and I should have. And I mean, hey, for those of you that have seen my videos, you guys know I've made some mistakes. I won't pretend, you know, anything other than what it is. Sometimes I pronounce things wrong or the wording isn't quite right. And sometimes I give an opinion that you may not agree with and that's okay. Sometimes a sentence is misworded in a script and almost every one of my scripts is a minimum of 4,000 words. So it's bound to happen when I'm making three videos every single week for you guys. But that also isn't an excuse if I make a factual statement about an experiment like the Zimbardo experiment, and then it's been proven wrong to a point that it almost could possibly invalidate portions of that original video. And I don't want the intent of that video being taken away. I mean, hell, sometimes new evidence comes to light like many months after I release a video speaking on that. And then I feel a little bit weird, but at the time I was making the video based off of the factual information I knew at that moment. But when I make factual errors such as this one, I do want to address it and it would be hypocritical not to. I call on companies to be honest about their business practices and I'll be honest and transparent with you guys about this one and where I get my information. So let's dive right in and see what the Zimbardo experiment was about, take two. So in my original video, here's what I said about the Zimbardo or Stanford prison experiment. The Zimbardo or Stafford prison experiment was a social psychology experiment in 1971 conducted by Professor Philip Zimbardo of Stanford University, hence the name. This is a really, really famous study and it's still obviously talked about to this day and movies have come out as recent as 2015 that base their storylines off of this study. So what happened to summarize is that Zimbardo took a group of middle-class college students and had them flip a coin. Some became prisoners and some became prison guards. This was to see how these guards would treat their fellow students based on the perceived divide between them. According to the lore that's grown up around the experiment, the guards with little to no instruction began humiliating and psychologically abusing the prisoners within 24 hours of the study's start. The prisoners in return became submissive and depersonalized, taking the abuse and saying little in protest. The behavior of it was so involved and so extreme that the experiment, which was meant to last two weeks, was terminated after only six days. However, what I neglected to mention and why it's been so discredited has to do with the coaching involved here. Stanford University released transcripts from 1971 where Zimbardo actually coached these prison guards and told them how to act. This was carefully directed, not a casual, you're a guard, you're the prisoner, have at it, that I thought it was. You can read them for yourself, though it was one audio clip that really caught my attention. Zimbardo is speaking with a guard, telling them, the purpose of the experiment is to see what this does to ordinary people, and we know it's not nice, but we don't know how it's not nice. Nothing too damning here at first. 
It is a little odd that he's telling the guard in question what he wants the outcome of the study to be, but the conversation he had with these students gets worse as it goes on. He tells them what he wants to see from their behavior, which in my eyes doesn't make it much of an experiment. Already the integrity has been compromised. If you are hinting to your test subjects what you want to see happen in the experiment, and then once the experiment is concluded, play it off as a natural human kind of situation, like this is just what happens when you put people in these positions type thing, it really, really doesn't make the study as honest as you think it is. And hearing his intentions really does give me some mixed emotions. Like the guy wanted to create prison reform to show how even young, seemingly average college students could come out of control in the 70s prison system. Raising awareness about the way prisoners are treated is worthwhile, absolutely, and I applaud those motives. However, the exaggerated picture he painted discredits the message he was trying to send in the first place. Plus, the mistaken faith people have in this study has gone on for nearly 50 years, myself included, and it wasn't until 2018 that many, many of the popular mainstream articles discrediting the experiment were even released. I'll start with one by Medium, which sheds some light on one of the most telling moments of the infamous study. It was late in the evening of August 16th, 1971, and 22-year-old Douglas Corpy, a slim, short-statued Berkeley graduate with a mop of pale, shaggy hair, was locked in a dark closet in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Department. Naked beneath a thin white smock bearing the number 8612, screaming his head off. I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, he yelled, kicking furiously at the door. Don't you know, I want to get out. This is all fucked up inside. I can't stand another night. I can't take it anymore. It was a defining moment in what has become perhaps the best known psychology study of all time. It has been invoked to explain the massacre at My Lai during the Vietnam War, the Armenian genocide and the horrors of the Holocaust. And the ultimate symbol of the agony that man helplessly inflicts on his brother is Corpy's famous breakdown, set off after only 36 hours by the cruelty of his peers. There's just one problem. Corpy's breakdown was a sham. Anyone who is a clinician would know that I was faking, he told me last summer in the first extensive interview he has granted in years. If you listen to the tape, it's not subtle. I'm not good at acting. I mean, I think I do a fairly good job, but I'm more hysterical than psychotic. Now, a forensic psychologist himself, Corpy told me his dramatic performance in the SPE was indeed inspired by fear, but not abuse of guards. Instead, he was worried about failing to get into grad school. The reason I took the job was that I thought I'd have every day to sit around by myself and study for my GREs, Corpy explained of the graduate record exams often used to determine admissions, adding that he was scheduled to take the test just after the study concluded. Shortly after the experiment began, he asked for his study books. The prison staff refused. The next day, Corpy asked again, no dice. At that point, he decided there was, as he put it to me, no point to his job. First, Corpy tried faking a stomach ache. When that didn't work, he tried faking a breakdown. Far from feeling traumatized, he added, he actually enjoyed himself for much of his short tenure in the jail, other than the tussle with the guards over his bed. Corpy goes on to explain that the only true moment of terror he actually felt was being told he couldn't leave, which Zimbardo himself says is a lie. Medium goes on to explain that after Zimbardo told me that Corpy and Yako's accusations were baseless, I read him a transcript unearthed by Le Trexier of a taped conversation between Zimbardo and his staff on day three of the simulation. An interesting thing was that the guys who came in yesterday, the two guys who came in and said they wanted to leave, and I said, no, Zimbardo told his staff. There are only two conditions under which you can leave, medical help or psychiatric. I think they really believe they can't get out. Now, okay, Zimbardo corrected himself on the phone with me. He then acknowledged that the informed consent forms which subjects signed had included an explicit safe phrase, I quit the experiment. Only that precise phrase would trigger their release. None of them said that, Zimbardo said. They said, I want out, I want a doctor, I want my mother, etc., etc." Essentially, I was saying, you have to say, I quit the experiment. But the informed consent forms that Zimbardo's subject signed, which are available online from Zimbardo's own website, contain no mention of the phrase, I quit the experiment. 
And there are a lot of problems with this. First of all, the students begging to leave shouldn't have to use an explicit phrase in the first place to be taken seriously. But if there was truly a safe phrase, it should absolutely be included in the consent forms. To hear that one of the breakdowns was really just a case of acting, yeah, I'm amazed I was taught this. Hell, I'm amazed that it was seen as evidence at all. You'd think that people would have done more investigating before including it in my psych textbooks, but here I am. Looks like my researcher and I have made the same mistake as many psychologists have used in their own classrooms. And in fact, this really could have been a fascinating study if it wasn't so doctored, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. I also wanted to see what some psychologists may have to say on the matter, including one man, Peter Gray, that explained why Zimbardo's prison experiment was never in his curriculum. Did he see something that others didn't? I admit that Ali and I had confirmation bias going into this particular topic. We were taught it in undergrad, so we were only looking for information about the study as it related to power, rather than even thinking about trying to question the study itself. But Peter Gray did just that. In a nutshell, here's the criticism somewhat simplified. 21 boys, okay, young men, are asked to play a game of prisoners and guards. It's 1971. There have recently been many news reports about prison riots and the brutality of guards. So in this game, what are these young men supposed to do? They're supposed to sit around and talk pleasantly with one another about sports, girlfriends, movies, and such? No, of course not. This is a study of prisoners and guards, so their job clearly is to act like prisoners and guards, or more accurately, to act out their stereotyped views of what prisoners and guards do. And he has an important point there that I didn't even consider. After all, this was the 70s. If you were asked to play a stereotypical version of a celebrity today, it would probably be very different from how celebrities were viewed in the 70s. Times change and current events shape people's views. It's not a stretch to think that these young men were playing ruthless prison guards because that's how the media portrayed them at the time. I mean, hell, if your only understanding of prison guards was based around the movie Shawshank Redemption or something, I doubt you'd be kind either. They were coached, they had negative stereotypes in mind and one prisoner claimed he was acting. I could end the video right here and say that's plenty of evidence to debunk this study, but I want to stress the misconceptions and go even deeper into the controversies that truly surround the Stanford prison experiments because it gets a lot messier. One man, Carlo Prescott, an ex-con himself, helped organize the experiment. Years later, he explained his take on the Stanford prison experiment, giving an inside perspective on the ordeal. In 2005, he stated, I read recently in the entertainment industry trade journal Variety of Maverick Entertainment, the principal of whom is Madonna, that intends to produce a film based on the infamous Stanford prison experiment. I read this with considerable consternation. According to the article, the project's principal investigator and the film's driving force, Professor Philip Zimbardo, this landmark experiment is a classical treatise on the power of the situation and a full-blown explanation of the evils of every person from Folsom to Abu Ghraib. I can assure you it is neither. I say this not because I am an African-American ex-con who served 17 years in San Quentin for attempted murder or one who spoke before Congress on the issue of prison reform. I say it because I was the Stanford Prison Experiment's chief consultant. I armed the Zimbardo, Craig Haney, and Kurt Banks with the ideas that enabled them to infuse this study with the verisimilitude that hangs its hat on today and shouldn't. Regrettably, the gulf between verisimilitude and real prison life is a huge leap of faith that still raises serious issues of validity from the get-go. Nevertheless, ideas such as bags being placed over the heads of prisoners, inmates being bound together with chains and buckets being used in place of toilets in their cells were all experiences of mine in the old Spanish jail section of San Quentin and which I dutifully shared with the Stanford Prison Experiment brain thrust months before the experiment started. To allege that all of these carefully tested, psychologically solid, upper middle-class Caucasian guards dreamed this up on their own is absurd. At the time, I had hoped that it would create a valid, intellectually honest indictment of the prison system. In hindsight, I blew it. I became an unwitting accomplice to the theatrical exercise that conveniently absolves all comers of personal responsibility for their abominable moral choices. 
And I know that is one hell of a long statement, but I wanted to give as much of it as possible and not take anything out of context, especially with how this video came to be. I can't say for certain if Zimbardo really told these guards to do this to the prisoners, but it sure as hell seems coincidental that they did exactly as Carlo described. Carlo Prescott, maybe like Zimbardo, wanted prison reform. He shared his experience in the hopes that it would give some insight to the treatment he received while serving time. Prison reform is an entirely different controversial topic in of itself. And using this experiment to demonstrate how badly we need it in some places would be perfectly acceptable. But we can't get there by deceiving the public and forcing evidence to fit our narrative. And once again, as I look deeper into Carlo Prescott and other criticisms of SPE, Stanford Prison Experiment, I found another interesting piece of information. One where Taylor Langley, Zimbardo's assistant, interviewed him in 2018. It reads, Langley, so critics of the Stanford Prison Experiment are claiming it was all a lie. These critics argue that Carlo Prescott, a paid prison consultant during the study, wrote a Stanford Daily article claiming the experiment was flawed and dishonest. Here we are today on July 11th, 2018, talking to Mr. Prescott himself to get to the truth. Um, so I just wanted to ask you one question. And the first one is, did you write or personally collaborate on the Stanford Daily Campus newspaper article? Prescott, to my knowledge, I've never endorsed, nor do I intend to ever have involved myself in something adverse, uh, adverse and derogatory to the Stanford prison experiment. As to my comments, absurd. About Philip Zimbardo, totally and absolutely absurd. I don't know why it isn't. Well, maybe I'll get a chance to tell you what I think later. Langley, yeah, thank you. Um, the second question is, are the negative allegations made in your name true? Prescott, no, positively, absolutely, without any hint. Langley, okay, so um, why didn't you request a retraction from the Stanford Daily Paper? Prescott, basically because I don't get a daily delivery. Langley, with laughter, yeah. Prescott, laughter. You sound like someone in Washington calling about my opinion on this Mexico thing. Ah, because I don't get the Stanford paper and because it never came to my attention. For some reason, the enmity that has been shown towards the experiment and towards in particular, my friend and brother, Philip Zimbardo are absurd, but understand clearly the answer is empathetically no. This is already way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. First, I believed the experiment. Then I figured it was a matter of him instructing the guards. And now we're tossing in false statements and interviews into the mix. Yikes. As for Zimbardo's defense about Doug Corpy's breakdown, he says the following. Blum portrays the case of Doug Corpy, alias prisoner 8612, as an instance of me being duped into believing that a prisoner was having an emotional breakdown when in fact the prisoner was simply faking a breakdown in order to leave the study early. The evidence Blum cites for this conclusion is that Corpy told Blum in an interview, I was faking. If you listen to the tape, you can hear it in my voice. I was being a good employee. It was a great time. To this criticism, I have two responses. First, I would argue that any researcher who believes a research participant is having a breakdown is ethically obliged to treat the breakdown as real, even if the breakdown later turns out to be feigned. And second, I'm not alone in regarding the breakdown as real because Doug Corpy himself went on record in quiet rage as saying that his time as a prisoner was the most upsetting experience of his life, an experience so profound that he went on to become a prison psychologist. For reasons I cannot fathom, Corpy's story has changed several times over the past 47 years, from genuinely losing control of his emotions to getting out of the study so he could lead an insurrection and liberate the other prisoners, to faking a breakdown just to get out of the study early for an upcoming graduate record exam, to other reflections and memory distortions. Regardless, the conclusions Corpy drew from the study in his quiet rage interview 17 years after the experience are fully consistent with my own conclusions. The Stanford prison was a very benign prison situation and it still caused guards to become sadistic and prisoners to become hysterical. I can agree that Corpy's breakdown should be treated as real, during testing anyway. You shouldn't assume someone's faking. Yet as for why Corpy's stories change so frequently, I can't say. Years and years later, he did say that the whole experiment, he was confused and he went into psychology because of it. And he said that he did because people become sadistic and hysterical. So do we believe Doug Corpy in this documentary or the Doug Corpy that was in Medium stating that his emotions were fake? Zimbardo claims he only claimed the breakdown was fake because he was embarrassed of the emotion, but it's not like I really trust him considering the beyond obvious bias he has in terms of the experiment being seen as credible in the first place now. 
Another interesting point he did mention, however, was when the BBC aired footage from a team that attempted to mimic the SPE results and failed. I wasn't even aware of this, but Zimbardo says this. An experiment based loosely on the SPE was filmed and broadcast on a four-part BBC TV show in May, 2002. Its results appeared to challenge those of the SPE because the guards showed little violence or cruelty toward the prisoners. Instead, the opposite occurred. When prisoners dominated the guards to the point where the guards became increasingly paranoid, depressed, and stressed, and complained most of being bullied. Several of the guards couldn't take it anymore and quit. None of the prisoners did so. Blum points to the TV show as another challenge to the validity of the SPE. However, in no way did this reality show meet the scientific criteria for a replication. From the time of being recruited with national ads to be actors in a university-backed social science experiment to be shown on TV, every participant knew their actions and voices from lapel mics they had to wear always would be seen and heard on national TV by family and colleagues. Any similarity to the intense buildup of emotional confrontation between SPE guards versus prisoners 24 seven was diluted by a daily itinerary of the British research team, Alex Halsham and Richard Reicher. These researchers frequently intervened, made regular public broadcasts into the prison facility, administered daily psychological assessments, arranged contests for the best prisoners to compete to become guards, and as in many reality TV shows, created daily confessionals for participants to talk directly to the camera about their feelings. Ironically, the results of this show could be interpreted as further evidence of the power of the situation, although in this case, the situation was that of reality TV. As invalid or discredited as the Zimbardo experiment has shown to be, I really doubt a televised experiment of this nature would be credible either. Of course, those in charge of the experiment fought back and stated, how has Zimbardo responded this time? By reasserting that none of these criticisms present any substantial evidence that alters the SPC's conclusion. And at the time that he berates his critics without engaging with their arguments, he reworks his story to now say that yes, guards were told to be tough, but how not to be tough. For Zimbardo then, this is all just fake news, except that it plainly isn't. This might have worked in the past, but now the necessary evidence is available to anyone who wishes to spend a few minutes listening to it. There is no longer any excuse for repeating a story which is so deeply flawed. We need to get busy rewriting our texts and revising our lectures. I haven't been able to find that BBC show and it might be buried in the depths of the internet somewhere, but I got the not currently available message from BBC themselves. So it's a little hard for me to judge, but I can understand where Zimbardo comes from, at least on that point. If it's set up and filmed like reality TV, it's hardly scientific. They'd be aware it's all for television. There'd be less fear, a sense of self-awareness, those elements that a true prison experiment wouldn't have. So look, I do agree that the Stanford prison experiment shouldn't be treated as fact. It's still an interesting topic, but there's a lot of worrying aspects in general as to why the study is questionable. Aside from what we already mentioned, it was funded by the US Office of Naval Research and when it was published, it was presented by the Navy as credible. That may not sound like a problem initially, but live science explains why it wasn't the best source of information. The results weren't published in a reputable peer-reviewed psychology journal, but rather the obscured journal Naval Research Reviews. Given that respected mainstream journals tend to have rigorous publication standards, apparently peer review did its job in this case. David Amodio, an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience social at New York University wrote on Twitter, that doesn't mean that real studies can't be published by the Naval Research Reviews or anything, but Yeah, it certainly doesn't help Zimbardo prove his point that SPE wasn't put through those same standards. So all in all, this whole experiment can't be seen as fact because from the onset, there has been proof of coaching. I don't know what to think about Corpy and Carlos or Zimbardo himself, but the audio doesn't lie. The transcripts from Stanford appear sound. So I have to put stock in anything, it's that. I can't say for certain whether that breakdown was real or fake. If the prison guards were playing a role or truly acting sadistic, if they learned these tactics from Carlos or if Zimbardo left them to their own devices at all. But there's enough questionable circumstances that, well, I shouldn't have included it in my research. It seems a bit strange to me that this study is still taught and used as an example of people's sadism. At the very least, I think there needs to be a giant asterisk next to those lessons with other sides presented. 
So with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And thank you to those of you for understanding that mistakes happen, especially when you're doing so many research intensive videos. But I really did want to address this because it's something that I actually understood as fact for many years. If you did like this video, make sure to hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. And if you want more content from me, make sure to pop open my description box. You're gonna find links for all of my social media, second channels that I work with and all that good stuff. So thank you guys for watching. Love you so much. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.